Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Victor. Thanks to all of you on the uh, Veterans Affairs Commission and all those who participate in the important community work to make sure that our, our veterans are afforded the appropriate respect and dignity and validation of not only their years of service, but also their presence and residency here in San Francisco. Uh, so I'm Mark Leno, and I have been a small business owner here in San Francisco for the past 40 years, and also have served on the County Board of Supervisors for four years, back in 1998 to 2002, at which time I went off to the state legislature serving six years in the state assembly and eight years in the state senate. And we did a lot of good work while we were in the legislature. Uh, much of it overlapped with many of the issues that we're going to be talking about here today, given that about 80% of those leaving the military leave without a job. There are severe challenges to mental and behavioral health, risk of suicide, access to programs and services that they are for veterans. Uh, and I know we'll dig into all of that. Uh, while in the assembly, I was able to exempt from the Ellis Act single room occupancies, which house about 12,000 San Francisco's most vulnerable house. Oftentimes they are seniors on fixed income those with disabilities, and oftentimes those living in our SROs are also veterans. And we protected all 12,000 by exempting them from the risk of being wholesale evicted through the Ellis Act. We are also able to raise California's minimum wage, first state in the country to raise California's minimum wage to $15 an hour. And of course, many of our veterans are also earning minimum wage. So overall in California, 5.8 million Californians will get a raise as a result of that legislation. And another 2 million Californians will be lifted out of poverty as it will no longer be legal to pay a sub-poverty wage in the state of California. As chair of the Senate Budget Committee, I was able to bring home $120 million to save City College when it was in the depths of its accreditation crisis. As the accreditation was threatened, enrollment plummeted. Funding from the state is based on enrollment numbers. As they fell further, state funding fell third, uh, further, and it, the college was in the death spiral. So we were able to bring on $120 million for four years of stabilization in its funding. And of course, City College is a gateway for anyone's future success and that includes many veterans who are returning to San Francisco. And just as we now have free city college, my proposal is that if you are able to get your AA degree at city college, we'll not only have a place for you at San Francisco State University, but I want to make that free state just as we have free city. And that will benefit all of those who are at, um, with access to that degree, but also given that California's going to have a million Bachelor of Arts degree deficit by 3030, many of the new jobs are going to require advanced education. We want to make sure our residents are having access to that education. And then also, with regard to the issue of housing, as California is closing down its redevelopment agencies, we always had a pot of money through redevelopment to build affordable housing. That was at risk of being deleted as well. And I was able to make the argument to Governor Brown that we have legally enforceable obligations at three redevelopment project sites, Mission Bay, Trans Bay, and Hunters Point Shipyard. And with that successful argument that I made to the government, Governor, I brought back $500 million to expedite the construction of 3,300 below market rate affordable housing units for San Francisco. And those 3,300 affordable units are now under construction. I also focused on a number of veteran-specific bills when I was in the legislature. Uh, for one, I authored a bill that would have created, did create actually, a peer and family support specialist certification program operated under the Department of Healthcare Services so that for those who are offering support for those dealing with mental health issues, whether it is a peer, someone who's been through it, him or herself before, or a family member, there could be a certification so that these people could get paid for the services they are providing before this bill that was not the case. 
Also, uh, we successfully moved through a bill that protects seniors from financial predators. There were scams set up to invite uh, senior veterans to come talk about financial issues, and then the scam would be that they would be directed into annuities and other kind of programs that made the salesperson a huge commission, but in fact destroyed the finances of these senior veterans, and so they are now protected from these scams. And then I know that a lot of seniors are suffering because though they struggle to get Section 8 housing vouchers, so often landlords will not accept these federally funded Section 8 housing vouchers. And so because they are a protected source of income, we wanted to put that into law. If you looked in Craigslist for apartments available, you would actually see listed no Section 8. No Section 8, no Section 8. And I thought, how can that be allowed? How can that be legal? You can't imagine an advertisement saying, no Jews, no gays, no Chinese. How could it be no Section 8? This is a secure source of income, a protected source of income. Unfortunately, we had to fight the industry over this, and we weren't successful. They were able to stop our bill. But as mayor, I would not only lobby Sacramento to bring that bill back, but also sit down with the Apartment Association. I know that they've got problems with the federal government, with housing and urban development, that it takes a long time for them to get their payments from the government, that it can be months that they'll have vacancies in their units. That's a problem, and I want to help them address it, but there's no reason to discriminate against people who are holding Section 8 housing vouchers. So let me just tell you that as mayor, my vision of the city is that this would be a veteran welcoming city, it would be a veteran serving city, and it would be a veteran safe city. We know that we've seen the number of chronically homeless veterans in San Francisco decreasing in recent years. Thanks to President Obama's leadership and making it a nationwide effort to make sure we house every veteran. Mayor Ed Lee did partner with the President on that and we made some great progress from 350 chronically homeless veterans in San Francisco in 2014 down to 196 in 2015 and now down to 137 in 2017. But that's still 137 too many. And I know that Ed Kaczynski, the Director of the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, has said that he wants to get that figure to zero by the end of 2018. I fully support that. And should we be fortunate for the department to get to that goal by the end of this year, then it is a consistent, ongoing challenge to keep it there. Doesn't mean the problem's been solved. Doesn't mean the work is over. That means we've just got to keep it up and make sure that we continue to house every veteran. I also want to bring note of the fact that uh, the survey in the study pointed out that a third of our veterans don't even know where to look for or where to access services. So that's very serious. A third is a good percentage number. And if folks are just out there without even knowledge of what kind of services there are in accessing housing or mental or physical health provision or for educational opportunities or job training opportunities, much less job placement, then we're failing our veterans. So I will be focusing on that in particular. And then there's also the issue of non-honorable discharges. And non-honorable discharges, of course, can destroy someone's future opportunities. And I know that there is a suggestion, a proposal, and I know that this would have to, have to happen at the federal government, that a single day of honorable service would afford one an honorable discharge. And I think that needs to be revisited. I think that's a seriously important idea because all of the outcomes for non-honorable dischargees are much more severe than for those with honorable discharges. And lastly, uh, the issue of risk of suicide is a very serious one. We've seen the numbers are off the charts. Upwards of 50% of San Francisco veterans are at risk of suicide, which is 50% higher than for non-veterans. 
We've got to provide the services, we've got to do the outreach, so our veterans know not only are those services available, but that San Francisco cares, and that San Francisco is here for you. So veterans, of course, would be a subset of that 3,500, but because there is some federal support for veterans that there does not exist for non-veterans, uh, this is a special opportunity for San Francisco to be able to make use of the federal programs. And so we've got to make sure we're getting everything out of the federal government as possible. There's a little bit coming from the state, but uh, different from those who are not veterans, uh, we've got some opportunities and we should be able to leverage them as well. The program that I put forward for the general population makes use of both single room occupancies, there are estimates of about 1,500 empty available SROs in town right now. That's minimal housing, yes, but for someone who's homeless, it is a roof over their head. And it's also important to find a roof for everyone who's homeless because I believe strongly in the concept of housing first, that there are many reasons why someone finds his or her way to the streets with regard to veterans, of course, it could be PTSD, it could be depression, other aspects of mental and physical health that are the result of having served in the military and for our country. But before we can deal with whatever those reasons might be, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, housing first, to be able to deal with these very complex issues, oftentimes psychologically driven, it's not going to be done successfully on the street corner. So housing first, and then we can get to the core of the problem. Yes, it takes time, yes, it takes diligence, yes, it takes concern and care, but we can do this, and we can certainly do much better than the status quo, which I believe is failing us and not providing us what we deserve coming from City Hall. Should I done this your last prompt? I'm out of time on this one. That's okay. I'll, I'll watch more carefully. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. So the next question is on mental health, which we've also touched on. Uh, one third of the veterans have considered suicide or have made plans to end their life by suicide. Um, more than half of the veterans uh, screen positive for PTSD uh, and depression. Um, Post-9-11 veterans are twice as likely as pre-9-11 veterans to engage in high-risk taking behaviors like driving after drinking alcohol, carrying a weapon, or looking to start a fight. Nearly 60% of post-9-11 veterans have a probable drinking problems. 50% uh, of veterans have reported a significant physical or mental health issue for which they are not receiving care. These numbers tell me we are facing an unprecedented crisis in mental health issues and a wave of secondary effects affecting families, co-workers, and friends of veterans in their community. As mayor, what will you do to improve mental health services in San Francisco? Certainly. So with regard to mental health services and provision of that, uh, not unlike housing, there is the opportunity to be partnering with the Veterans Administration to get everything that we can out of the federal government to help us assist and deal with those who are living in San Francisco in need of these services. And as I mentioned earlier, it's very disconcerting to me that a third of our veterans don't even know 
where to turn or that they can access services either provided through the VA or through our county government system. So there's need for greater outreach. We've got to be proactive in meeting veterans where they are so that they can figure out, find out from us where they can turn and we bring services to them if they don't know enough to come to us to access them. With the greater issue of mental health service provision here in San Francisco, I'm proposing a mental health justice center. So many of our homeless who interact with the city is through police and law enforcement. They get taken to county jail, they spend a few days in jail. 50% of those in our county jail are receiving mental health services, 20% psychotropic drugs. No one is getting better in a jail cell. We're wasting a lot of money. These folks are then released back to the street without a health plan, without a case manager, a treatment plan, and the cycle repeats itself. And we're not making any kind of progress. So the alternative would be a mental health justice center, very similar to what they're doing in Alameda County, very successfully. They call it psychiatric emergency services. They've got a place where folks dealing with mental and behavioral health and addiction issues can go, not to the emergency room where the emergency rooms are not, and the docs there are not trained for this population, but a place specifically for them that is not law enforcement, that is not our county jail, so that we can assess and diagnose and then treat and stabilize these mental health crises. And then, of course, the question is, where are we going to put them? The good news is I was able to access $100 million from the state of California before I left the Senate Budget Committee, specifically for San Francisco. It's two billion statewide, 100 million for San Francisco, earmarked to build permanent supportive housing for formerly homeless people with mental health issues. We could build upwards of 400 units of permanent supportive housing for those with mental health issues who have been living on the streets. And so that would make a Take, take us a step forward in a very significant way, a place for those we don't have today with mental health needs, under a roof with permanent support of uh, housing and the wraparound services necessary. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, next question is on employment. Yes. Veterans face a disproportionately yeah. Veterans face a disproportionately high rate of unemployment and underemployment in San Francisco. 80% of service members will leave the military without a job, and almost 60% of post-9-11 veterans in San Francisco reported that their military skills and experiences are dismissed by employers. As a result, 83% of post-9-11 veterans who work full-time have an annual salary that is below $60,000. 40% have jobs uh, that earn less than $36,000 a year. That is simply not enough to survive, much less thrive a dignified, much less live a dignified life. As mayor, what will you do to make sure veterans find appropriate employment in San Francisco? Thank you, Paul. So again, not unlike our general population right now, we need to make sure we get much more out of the extraordinary success and expansion of new industries in San Francisco, whether it's the tech sector or any other new burgeoning business sector, my question always is, what's in it for San Franciscans? Yeah, we know there are a lot of corporations and a lot of titans in those corporations who are becoming billionaires and millionaires overnight. But what about San Franciscans? You know, we've created tens of thousands of new jobs here recently. And the presumption is all of these new jobs are going to be taken by people coming from out of town. And we see our population increasing, which puts a demand on our housing. We're having trouble keeping up with housing supply. I want to see a much greater percentage of these new jobs created locally hired. Local hire, this is the mantra you're going to hear from me very often. We have a local hire requirement in the building trades, but why should it be limited to the building trade? We're creating all these new jobs. Don't tell me we don't have underemployed, educated, well-prepared San Franciscans to take some of these jobs. So that's my general riff on how we should be better and more focused on the well-being of San Franciscans as we continue to give permits and entitlements for these new industries to build more corporate offices and more commercial space so they can hire more people. Again, what's in it for us? 
San Franciscans should benefit from this wave of prosperity. Now, segue to the needs, the special needs of veterans. I would carve out a special sector of focus for veterans employment, and a sector of that local hiring should be for veterans, just as we have a special attention on housing homeless veterans, we should have special attention on employing veterans who are either unemployed or underemployed. That means outreach, that means working with these new industries to find out, yes, I understand a small percentage of them will be for very highly trained technical folks. There'll be worldwide searches for the best and the brightest. But what percentage of these are administrative jobs? What percentage of these are marketing jobs or sales jobs? Jobs that we know San Franciscans could fill and jobs that we know that veterans could fill. So I'll be focusing on locally hiring and locally hiring veterans. Nearly 75% of all veterans in San Francisco have reported difficulties adjusting to civilian life, and 33% report that they do not know where to go or who to contact to get help. Nearly two-thirds of post-9-11 veterans indicated that civilians do not appreciate the sacrifices they've made, with more than 80% indicating that civilians don't understand their problems. As mayor, what will you do to help reintegrate veterans into our community? You know, this goes back to some fund fundamental changes that this country made. Uh, when I was a young man, the Vietnam War was raging. Clearly there was a lot of debate over the value of that war, riots in the streets. A lot of veterans came home <coughs> really unappreciated. In fact, often feeling as if they were fighting, that the impression they were getting from parts of the general public is that they were fighting a war that was worth fighting, which only doubled their suffering. But at the time, we had a draft, and everyone was eligible, short of some so-called presidents that kept getting deferred for some sort of spur. I don't know what that was all about. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, it was a sacrifice spread more equally and equitably across the country. I'm not suggesting that there's a draft coming back to the United States. No, it's not going to happen, because it's so much easier for this country to keep letting our leaders take us into wars, and wars that may be unnecessary and put too many people in harm's way if we just leave it to a certain portion of our populace to go do that work for us. But the rest of us will be spared. So there's inequity in the very foundation of how we serve our country today. And so it's no surprise that when people come back from service that they're not going to be understood by the general public who never had to sacrifice anything. So there are a couple of ways to go about this. Uh, I think that, of course, we need more outreach, just as we do in access to the services. But for the reintegration of veterans, veterans represent every creed, color, race, nation of origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, is all the rest of us. And so, might veterans find a place to reintegrate if they were from the LGBT community at the LGBT community center? And might a veteran from the African American community find better reentry in some African American community center? Where we have centers set up, let's make that a portal of reentry for our veterans. But beyond that, maybe the city should be talking about it. I'm not here to suggest that I know anything more. I, as mayor, would very much follow the recommendations that come from the Veteran Affairs Commission. That's why we have a commission, to review all the many needs of our community, our veterans community, and make recommendations to the Board of Supervisors and to the mayor. But one idea that I might like to float is, might we benefit, all of us, from a veterans community center? So we could have a general place where veterans could know they feel at home, it would be a one-stop shop for veterans to be able to learn about and access all the many services that are there for them. So I think my time's up. Do I make a closing statement? I hope I've stayed close to my time.
Thank you. Uh, I've had the pleasure of getting to know some of the commissioners over the years, and I've, I've learned a lot from my good friend, Victor Oliveri, now serving on the commission. And the complexities of the challenges facing the veterans community are real and many. And as a public official over these past 18 years, I've always been able to do my best when I learn and when I close my mouth and I open my ears and I listen. Because that's when I'm better informed as to what any one community throughout the diverse communities of San Francisco actually need. And those of us in public service should be here serving those needs. So I want to work together with you, the veterans community. I want to learn from you, I want to learn from the commissioners, and then we set a plan of action and then we execute that plan of action so that as much of our veterans community receives the respect and dignity in terms of housing, food security, that's another point that was made in the report. Off the charts number of veterans who don't even know where the next meal is coming from, the mental and physical health services that they need, access to job training or job placement, all of those needs, and set a course of action execute it and make sure everyone is cared for. Thank you very much. So yes, I would agree with you. I like the idea of free muni service for veterans. And how far we are able to expand it, that's open to discussion. But minimally, to get to appointments, you bet that's something we should have. Thank you. Thank you very much. 